Hi guys, welcome to Cryptids Canada. I'm so happy to see you and I'm so happy you're here. I can't wait to tell you this story. It's a really good one. Hi Leslie, my name is Tim. I'm one of those kids from the 70s who played with one of those crazy looking kids who had weird parents who spied on us, but rarely let us go off on our own. I lived in Hope, BC, and it was a one horse town back in the 70s with lots of barefooted kids running around. Now, of course, my buddy Rick and I know now what it was, but then we were just stupid kids who were allowed to do pretty much anything if it was summer between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m., which was dinner time, and then I was back out until God knows when. Parents back then just never checked on their kids. That's why those service announcements started. You know, it's 11 p.m., do you know where your kids are? LOL. Sad that a TV announcement had to remind mothers to check and see if their kids were in bed. Oh, God forget a kid get kidnapped. The kidnapper always knew he had till 11 p.m. before the cops would be called. LOL. But you know what I mean. All in good fun. Anyway, my buddy Rick and I were joined at the hip. We both had the same upbringings. The year it started, we were about nine or ten. We were wild and free. If we came to a pond, we would strip down till we were butt naked and we would swim all day. We would head down Water Street on our bikes and go towards a spot that we discovered one day while we were heading towards Hope Mountain. We watched a coyote cross the road in front of us, so we stopped and watched it take a well-worn path into the woods. Let's go, we said. So we rode our bikes down this hard-packed trail and into the woods after the coyote. We went as far as we could on our bikes and decided to park the bikes and keep walking. Then we came across what we now believe were Bigfoot structures. We were in awe. We saw a teepee-looking structure, and then we heard the sound of what we swore was a monkey. We convinced ourselves that someone had let a monkey loose. Sure enough, we saw a kid that looked like a monkey boy. He was hiding behind the trees. Rick started trying to coax him out like you would a dog, whistling and snapping his fingers. Then the monkey boy ran away. I finally convinced Rick to come with me to scope out an area for a fort. Otherwise, he would have chased that monkey boy around those woods the whole day. So after we left and found an area that had been cleared out, except for like five 15-inch round trees in a perfect circle. It was really odd, but we just assumed that they were planted like that. Of course, it never occurred to us that maybe the trees around them were taken out, but I digress. So we left and then came back the next day with tools and tarps to build a tent to sleep in and hang out in. Later in the day, we saw that monkey kid again, we honestly had no clue he was anything other than a deformed kid. We noticed about lunchtime that the kid was still spying on us. We stopped to eat our peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and Rick held up a sandwich for the monkey boy. He went down on his hands and feet and started sniffing the air like a dog, and then he got within arm's reach, and he snatched the sandwich from Rick and ran back behind the tree again like a dog. I didn't like that kid at first, but Rick did, and he kept trying to get the kid to come over and join us. Every day it was the same thing. The kid would just appear from nowhere and be standing behind the trees. Then every day Rick would offer him some food, mainly peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And finally, after a few days, he just stayed beside Rick for like a half an hour. Then he scaled a tall tree with his hands and feet. Rick and I both were amazed at his agility. 
When he stopped at the top branch, he dove through the air to another tree. Then he came down the same way he went up, and then he ran away. After that, we didn't see him for a few days. Then he showed up again out of the blue. When we went to eat our lunch, the kid grabbed Rick's peanut butter and jelly sandwich and shoveled it down in seconds. Rick yelled, hey, and pushed the kid. That's when we heard really loud growling sounds coming from the woods. So we took off running. We thought it was a bear because there was rumors of a grizzly sighting in the area. We waited a couple of days and finally we went back. Our tarps were pulled down and the camp was just a mess. So we started cleaning up again. Then again, the monkey kid came into camp and just sat on a log watching us. So we sat down with him and started talking to him. He really did look like he was trying to figure it all out. We actually started being friends with him. He would bring us handfuls of berries and we would give him peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. When he started licking the jelly off the sides of the sandwiches, we started calling him PB and J, or just J for short. So this went on all summer. We would hear his parents do weird chattering sounds, and he would get up and go. If we started roughhousing, the parents would always growl loudly, even if it was just me and Rick. Then if PB and J wanted to wrestle, they would freak out and make him leave. Then, once school started, we pretty much stopped going there until spring break the next year. We were shocked to see PB and J peeking around the trees, just like he used to. He looked a lot bigger than we recalled, but eventually he came over and sat with us. The next month, we discovered a creek, which we heard was called Ruby Creek. We spent every day there for the first couple of weeks of summer. Then one day, I just happened to look up, and there was PB and J eating our sandwiches. I was mad, but Rick was happy to see him, and he ran up to say hello, and Rick thought nothing of giving him a hug because that's the kind of person Rick was, and that was it. Again, this time, we heard several loud growls. That was way more aggressive sounding than before, and I looked to see where it was coming from, and I thought I saw a large shape that was taller than our neighbor's draft horses, and those horses were shown for their large size. But I didn't see it clearly. But what I did notice was that PB and J was now at least a foot taller than he was the last fall. So all that summer, it was much the same. The last couple of weeks, we decided to go back to the old camp and spend the night. Of course, we lied to each of our parents, you know the old routine? Rick was sleeping at my house and I was sleeping at his. Rick told me that he had heard a story that 30 years earlier a family saw a Sasquatch near Ruby Creek. He told me the story and just then PB and J showed up and all of a sudden we realized this was no monkey boy. This was a Sasquatch boy. The moment we discovered this, we both agreed our blood ran cold. But the one thing we had on our side was food. PB and J was super docile when we had food. The night went by without incident, and on our way home the next day, we talked about whether it was even safe for us to keep going back there. So when we got home, Rick started asking around about Sasquatch. And he called me so excited. He said if we got a picture of PB and J, we could be rich. So we devised a plan to steal my mom's new Kodak camera that she bought to take pictures of her sister's wedding. So the next day, we made a whole loaf of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And we used our old fail-proof plan of sleeping at each other's houses. And we left after dinner to go to our spot. We started talking loudly as we waited patiently as it started to get dark. Finally, PB and J showed up, and Rick was sitting on the ground leaning up against a fallen log. PB came over and sat right beside Rick, but on the log. I had my mom's camera on my lap, and I turned it on thinking I had to, but now I know it was the on button for the flash. 
It emitted a high-pitched squeal, and I saw a PB start to look around, and I took the picture. All hell broke loose. PB was screaming, and he came over, and he grabbed the camera and literally squeezed it till it crunched, and then he threw it down on the ground in front of me. It hit the ground so hard that the camera broke into pieces. That's also when I saw, for the first time, PB's parents. They came out of the woods screaming and swinging their arms and swiping at the dirt and pine needles. The debris was hitting me in the face and going in my eyes and my mouth. Rick was holding his head into his knees. Finally, he got up and came over beside me and we just sat there cowering. These two giants were definitely towering over top of us. At that point, PB just ran away and then his parents, who looked just like him, ran after him. They went one way and we went the other. That was it for our camping excursions and trips to Ruby Creek. Rick and I stayed super close and I went to university and Rick moved to Alberta. Then, out of the blue, I got a call from Rick in 1993. 18 years after the experience with the Sasquatch, Rick went home after his dad died. He was packing up his old childhood room so his mother could get the house ready to sell. He found the old 110 film that he'd grabbed after PB smashed the camera. He had completely forgotten about it. So just for fun, he took it in and got it developed. And when he got the film back, there was just one picture and he actually saw himself sitting on the ground, and beside him on the log was PB. It showed almost all of PB, except for his head, was mostly out of the picture, from one eye up. It showed his massive chest and the 10 or 11 year old Rick. Rick also said that the picture had a blue discoloration, which the place said can happen with age. I asked if Rick could make a copy and send it to me, and he said he would, but I never received it. When I asked Rick about it, he said that he had loaned it to a friend to show another guy, and somehow it got lost. Of course it happened like that. So that's my story, and I've changed our names for our privacy. Also, you will notice that I've included a picture and the story of the Ruby Creek incident if you want to include that with my story. Oh, I absolutely appreciate that, Tim. So we'll move on to the Ruby Creek incident. I'm also putting the picture up as well for you guys to look at while I tell you the story. So it is rumored that this was the experience that interested John Green in his research and pursuit of the Sasquatch phenomenon. So, as it is said, in 1941, an indigenous couple, the Chapmans, and their three children, who lived in a little house on the banks of the Fraser River, the wife and mother, Jeannie Chapman, was alone with her children when a Sasquatch approached the house. Jeannie quickly gathered her children together and fled to find her husband, George, who worked nearby on the railroad tracks. Jeannie told him that a Sasquatch was after her, and later she said it was about seven and a half feet tall. George and other men went to the house and found large human-like footprints about 17 inches long. The tracks led to a shed connected to the house where a heavy barrel of fish had been dumped out. The tracks then led to a wire fence that the Sasquatch evidently stepped over and then went up into the mountains. A deputy sheriff, Joe Dunn, from Bellingham, Washington, went to the house immediately and made a cast of one of the footprints. The family continued to live in the house, but was bothered by strange howling noises and their agitated dogs, which appeared to sense an unusual presence, which forced the Chapmans to vacate within one week. The house eventually fell into ruin. Then, in 1957, John Green heard of the encounter, and he and Renee DeHinden investigated the Chapman's claims. John knew and respected the Chapman's, so he was convinced that what they said was indeed the truth. And that is the end of the Ruby Creek Incident.
So guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode because you know I surely did. I hope everybody has a great evening. And of course, I'll see you back here in a day or two. You know I love ya. Bye for now.